Okay, so uh, good morning. We are talking about vector spaces, and I want to start with a pretty, I think, pretty elementary observation that the definition of linear independence, which we gave for vectors in Rn, generalizes without issue to other vector spaces. I mean, you can make the statement, you can set up this linear combination for vectors in any vector space, because addition and scalar multiplication are defined in any vector space. Every vector space has a zero vector. So this is always a coherent statement that this linear combination equals zero. And you can always make the statement then that these vectors of v1, v2, up to vn are linearly independent if, and in fact, this is a definition, so if and only if this only as has the trivial solution. So this is, I mean, the exact same definition that we gave for column vectors, but now we're in an arbitrary vector space. Maybe these Vs are functions or polynomials or something more complicated. Um, in general, for an arbitrary vector space, there's no generic way of showing that vectors are independent. For, uh, for Rn and subspaces of Rn, it's straightforward. I mean, you might forget how to do it in the heat of the moment, but it's straightforward in the sense that we're taking a matrix and performing Gauss-Jordan elimination on it. The same thing we've been doing for basically this entire semester. Whereas if you're in, say, C is zero, the space of continuous functions. And I give you the vectors cosine two X, sine squared X, cosine squared x. And I asked you if these vectors are linearly dependent or linearly independent. There's no, as I say, no generic method for answering a question like this. If you happen to at some point have memorized this, and I, I haven't, I I never commit trig identities to memory unless I have a concrete use for them. But if you happen to know that the cosine of 2x is the cosine squared minus the sine squared, then you can say, well, zero is negative one times the cosine of 2x plus positive 1, the cosine squared of x, plus negative 1, the sine 
square root of x. And then you can look at that and say, oh, they're dependent because this is a non-trivial combination that is equal to zero. Uh, a point of order or a technical point that zero, it can be a little confusing because we're so used to seeing something like that and thinking right, we need to solve it. We need to find the values of X that make it true. That zero on the left is the zero function. It's the constant function F of X equals zero. I'll use the vector notation to drive that tone. So this is not an equation where we look for values of x that make it true. This is a statement that one vector is equal to a linear combination of other vectors. Um, a lot of the stuff we've said about linear dependence in Rn also holds just for arbitrary vector spaces. Um, for example, theorem. Suppose you have some collection of vectors. I don't want to say V equals this because, because um, V is reserved for vector spaces and a vector space isn't going to be a finite list. Suppose we have some List of vectors and it's dependent. Then some vector in the list is a linear combination of the other vectors in the list. The textbook says this in a slightly different way. And the textbook says this in a way that makes it sound like it's stronger than what I have written on the board, but it really isn't. What, what the textbook says is that some vector in this list is a linear combination of the previous vectors in the list. So V1 is a, so V2 is a linear combination of V1, or V3 is a linear combination of V1 and V2, or V4 is a linear combination of V1 and V3, etc. But, um, but sets are unordered. I mean, you can, I, I call this a list, it's a set. Um, and sets are unordered and you can write them in everything in the set in a different order and it should never matter. So I don't know that it's, that I want to refer to previous vectors. Um, I mean, bearing in mind that you can just, just, rearrange the vectors. I mean, if you have V1, V2, V3, and you don't have what the textbook has, maybe V2 is a linear combination 
of V1 and V3. Well, you can simply rearrange the set. So now, like the textbook says, V2 is a linear combination of the previous vectors in the list. And so the textbook does this because he's a, the author, David Lay, is more interested in giving proofs than I am, and some proofs will require a little less writing. But, I mean, the take-home message is that we had this for column vectors, we have this for arbitrary vectors. Being dependent means one of the vectors is a linear combination of the other vectors. And now, one of the major definitions of mathematics, well, before that, a preliminary definition, although also important, we talked about the span of vectors in Rn. Um, the span of vectors, bless you, in some arbitrary vector space V is defined in a parallel way. It's all of the linear combinations of the vectors in the set. And if a vector space equals the span of some vectors, we say those vectors Span the vector space. So span can be a verb or a noun. We can say that some vectors have a span. We can also say some vectors span the vector space. Now, a very significant definition. And again, David Lay, I really like this textbook. It's just one or two sort of oddities in it. David Lay says, suppose we have a vector space V and we have some subspace living inside of it. So we don't really have notation for subspace versus subset, but H is a subspace of V. Now suppose, and I'm just repeating lay verbatim here, I'm going to have some comments on this. But suppose we have some vectors in V. And these vectors in V satisfy two conditions. First, these vectors span H. That is to say, if we look at all of the linear combinations of these vectors, we get H. Second, these vectors
are they are the independent? Then if we have a set of vectors that spans H and is linearly independent, then this set of vectors is called a basis of H. And this is sort of one of the most fundamental, and I would say one of the most general definitions in mathematics. Like if you look, I mean, this definition as we've stated it is a linear algebra definition, but you look at, you know, other fields of abstract algebra, and you can have the notion of a basis. You'd call it like a generating set. And you look at topology, and you have the notion of a basis. You look at a bunch of different fields, and they might not call it this, they might have a slightly different definition, but the idea that this set of Vs is sort of the foundation of this entire infinite vector space is very fundamental. Because I mean, that's what this is saying. How do you define an infinite vector space? You can't just list the vectors. Well, this is giving you one way you can give a basis of the infinite vector space. Um, I've said, I mean, this is a very important definition. In a few ways, it's a sort of weird one, the way David Lay has presented it. Um, let me first of all make the observation that, um, I mean, I guess I say first of all, the main observation I want to make this stuff with the subspace is really unnecessary. Um, if V1, V2, up to Vn are going to be a basis of H, the only way that can happen is if V1 and up to Vn are inside of H. And then it's like, once you've made that observation, what's this V even doing? Let's say that H is a vector space. And we've got these vectors of V1 up to Vn inside this vector space and they span the vector space, and they're linearly independent, then they're a basis of the vector space. And I have no idea what, what benefit David Lay thought he was getting from that space V, or from talking about subspaces. Uh, let me make the observation, though, I mean, H is a subspace of itself. So, I mean, David Lay's definition works perfectly well. You know, you just say that H be a subspace of itself. And then David Lay's definition becomes identical to what we have on the screen. So it's not really hurting anything. It's just a little weak. At least I think so. Um, let's give some examples. Let's start with Rn. 
the columns of any in in vertebrae n by n matrix are a basis of R N, and this uh, this is a this is a corollary of the invertible matrix theorem. That big list of like twenty equivalent statements that I put on the white. Board at one point. Um, two of the three of the things on the list, three equivalent statements are the mat a square matrix is invertible, its columns are linearly independent, and its columns span R N. So that's where this example comes from. Thinking back to linear transformations, although people struggled with this material on the test, so maybe I'd better remind everyone what these are. E1 is the vector that has one in the first component and is zero everywhere else. E2 is the vector that has one in the second component and is zero everywhere else, and so on. Um, this is the standard basis of R N. And it's actually a special case of that um, example above it. The identity matrix I is invertible. So according to this statement up here, the columns of I are a basis of R N, and the columns of I are precisely this standard basis. So moving into the concrete, let's say R2. The standard basis is one zero zero one. But there are an infinite number of bases, like um one seven two two, I say two four. Um this is an invertible matrix. You could check that by manually finding the inverse. It does exist. So because this is an invertible matrix, its columns form an alternative basis of R2. So, in fact, any vector space is going to have an infinite number of bases. Uh, sometimes some of them are nicer to work with than others. I mean, there's a reason that, that we picked one basis and said, this is going to be our standard. But bases are not unique.
P sub N, which we'll remind ourselves, polynomials of degree less than or equal to N. This has another so-called standard basis. Uh, bases are traditionally identified by kind of a fancy looking B, or if you have more than one uh, basis, you start with B and count up. So the traditional way of writing of naming a basis would be something like that. The standard basis of the polynomials of degree less than or equal to n is these powers. We've got the constant function one, and then x, x to the first, x to the second, x to the third, up to x to the n. Um, this is a basis. I don't know if that's obvious. I mean, it's probably obvious that these span. Pn, because I mean, what is a polynomial? Like one plus two x minus three x squared. I mean, a polynomial is a constant times this first number, then the two times the second entry in the basis a negative three times this fourth entry in the basis. Uh, um, nope, a negative three times the third entry of the basis and so on. I mean, polynomials intuition that x cubed cannot be written as a linear combination of 1x x squared and so on. But um, the formal proof is actually pretty cute. Let's say Let's say we have a linear combination of these um, entries of the basis and they're equal to zero. Um, and again, this is where this is where this um, notation can be deceptive. I mean, ordinarily, if you see an equation like that, you think, okay, I'll go to my calculator and solve it. But this is the constant zero polynomial. It's not a number. So I claim this has no non-trivial solutions. And my argument is the fundamental theorem of algebra. If this polynomial has a degree, a degree n, it can have 
at most n roots. I mean, this isn't exactly the fundamental theorem of algebra, but it's a corollary of it. So if this polynomial has a degree, it can be zero only n times. Well, the zero polynomial is zero everywhere. The zero polynomial has an infinite number of zeros. So a polynomial with at most n zeros can't equal a polynomial that's zero everywhere. So the only possible solution is if the polynomial on the left doesn't have a degree, but the only polynomial without a degree is the zero polynomial, zero plus zero x1 plus zero x2 up to zero xn. So all of those coefficients have to be zero, otherwise there's a degree and this equality is impossible. So that's <laughs> the standard basis of P sub N. We'll work with that in the future. <laughs> uh, does anybody have any questions? And let me state the spanning set theorem. So the spanning set theorem has two parts. Part one, suppose you have a dependent set. So you have vectors v1 up to vn, and they're dependent. That is to say, one of the vectors in the set is a linear combination of the other factors. Then removing that factor does not change the span of the set. Give you a moment to copy that down, and then we can look at a quick example to clarify it. Okay, let's go into R4. And let's say we have the vector 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, and 1, 0, 0. This 
these are dependent set. And in particular, um, the vector one, zero, zero, one is a linear combination of the other two vectors. So what this first part of the spanning set says is that getting rid of this vector, which is a linear combination of the rest, won't change the span. The span of these three vectors, let's see, keep them in the same order they were in. So the span of these three vectors is the same as the span of the first two vectors because the third one was a linear combination. We can kick it out and it won't change the span. And that's the first part of the spanning set theorem and it occasionally gets used on its own, but really we told you that story so we could tell you this one. Suppose we have a vector space and this vector space is spanned by some vector. Now, those vectors might be a basis, or they might not be. They satisfy the first condition, they span the space, they might or might not satisfy the second condition, because they might or might not be independent. Um, the second part of the spanning set theorem says we can turn this collection of vectors into a basis if it isn't one already by kicking some vectors out. And I mean, obviously, I framed that a little informally, but I hope that combined with the first part of the spanning set theorem, it's clear what we're doing here. We're specifically kicking out vectors that are linear combinations of other vectors. So we have B and we have V1, V2, V3, V4, let's say V5. Uh, one and and these V's, these lowercase V's span the vector space. 
Well, one of two things is going to be true here. Either this is a basis or it isn't. If it's not a basis, it's because they're not linearly dependent linear the independent. That is to say, if it's not a basis, it's because they're dependent. And one of the vectors is a linear combination of the others. According to the first part of the spanning set theorem, if we erase that, the vectors that remain still span V. So now we repeat that process. V is spanned by these three vectors. Either those are a basis or they're not. If they're not, it's because they're dependent. If they're dependent, one of these vectors is a linear combination of the rest. The spanning set theorem says we can pick it out. So these three vectors remain. Um, either they're a basis or they aren't. And we keep going. And um, we have to stop at some point because V cannot be a span of no vectors. So there's no possibility that we just keep going until all of the vectors are kicked out. At some point, we create a basis, and this process ends. Um, the statement here, this supposition is really important because there are vector spaces that don't have finite bases. And if you have an infinite number of vectors, this argument breaks down because if you have an infinite number of vectors, I mean, you could just keep deleting vectors forever and never get to a basis. So we're assuming that V is spanned by finitely many vectors. Um, fortunately, basically all of the vector spaces we look at in linear algebra are spanned by finitely many vectors. We'll get to that. Next section, the section after that, we'll get to that this chapter anyway. Spanning set theorem. That's the remainder of what's left in this textbook section. There are two topics. Finding the basis of a null space. Finding the basis of a column space. And we hypothetically know how to find the basis of a null space. I mean, I say hypothetically, because some students struggled a little with this material on the test. Um, and, and that's why I said, you know, showing that something is uh, a linear transformation by the definition, whatever, you miss it, pick yourself up, move on. But solving equations like this and being able to write them in a parametric form, I said that that was important and that if you missed that problem, you should review that material. Um, find 
the basis of no A when A equals one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, six. I have kind of an idea. Five, six, seven, six. So we're going to, I mean, the, the, the no space by definition is found by solving ax equals zero. And to find the basis of the no space, we're going to basically just, basic, huh? just find the no space and the basis will fall right out from that. So let's see how this works. To set this equal to zero, we augment it with the zero vector. Then we go into our, our calculator. Covering up the button, there we go. And we put it in and we perform gauss jordan elimination. So A is, let's see, two by five. Try that again, two by five. One, two, three, four, zero, five, six, seven, six, zero. Get out, go back to the matrix menu, track down RREF, select A, and this is what we get. Let me go back to the whiteboard. Let's see, new share. Somehow, still not totally used to this. And we get one zero, negative one, negative three, zero. Zero, one, two, three point five, zero. So we're going to set up a uh, set, write our answers in parametric form, um, even though, I mean, we don't have a system of linear equations. So we really don't have X's and Y's, but we'll think of this, you know, the columns represent um, variables, except for the last <laughs> column, which represents equality, bless you. X1 minus X3 minus three X4 equals zero x2 plus 2x3 plus 3.5x4 equals 0. Get the x1 and the x2 on the left, and the x3 and the x4 on the right. Why those X's? What is it about X1 and X2 that makes me put them on the left? What is it about X3 and X4 that makes me put them on the right? X3 and X4, 3 and Exactly correct, thank you. X3 and X4 are three.
we are putting our three variables over here. And then this trick where we say, well, x3 equals itself. And x4 equals itself. And then we take these coefficients and we make vectors out of them. And those vectors are the basis of the null space. One, negative two, one, zero. And three, negative 3.5, zero, one. Any questions about this, about finding the basis of a null space? Again, this is, you know, in practice, sometimes you see material and, you know, you don't really need to learn it because it's not going to come back again. That is not the case with you know, solving these equations and setting up parametric solutions, you see it has come back again. So finding the basis of a column space. Finding a spanning set of a column space is the easiest thing. The columns of the matrix are a spanning set of the column space. Um, but that spanning set might not be linearly independent. Um, so to find the basis, I'll tell you how it works. Give it columns form a basis. So we're going to perform Gauss Jordan elimination and we're going to find the pivot columns. The only thing I have to say, sort of a warning is that Gauss-Jordan elimination changes the column space. So make sure that when we're um, finding the column space, we go back and use the original matrix. So say that that A is something like oh one, two, three, four, negative one, negative two, zero, six. And we want to find a basis of the column space of A. Well, we're not setting anything equal to anything. We don't need to uh, augment this. We just need to go to our calculator. Matrix edit was two by four. One, two, three, four. A negative one, negative two, zero, 
What was the last entry? Six. Six. Thank you. So we quit out. You perform reduced row echelon form on this thing. So remember that a pivot position is the first non-zero entry in a row after we perform Gaussian elimination or Gauss-Jordan elimination. So the pivot columns are the first column and the third column. This one up here in the first column is a pivot position. This one down here in the third column is also a pivot position. And all I was getting at with that warning is that the basis we're getting from this process comes from the original me. One, negative one, three, zero. With a, you know, the sort of error you sometimes see is that students will do this and then use the new matrix and give one, zero, zero, one, which well, bad example, because it turns out that this is also a basis for the column space, but that won't be true in general. In general, row operations change the column space, so you can't do any, you can't use the new matrix that you get by performing row operations. You just you're looking for pivot columns here, the first and the third. And then once you found those, you go back to your original matrix. A basis of the column space of A is One negative one three zero. That's it for this section. With only ten minutes remaining, we won't move on to the next one. Does anybody have any questions? before we adjourn. Then I will see you Thursday.